Hi everyone, my name is Kinya Ota. I have spent more than 10 years studying goldfish development and evolution. Recently, my friend asked me to make detailed videos about goldfish development and evolution. So I have decided to produce this video series based on my papers and book. We will explore goldfish evodivo. In this episode, I will explain the historical background of goldfish. This will be helpful in considering the evolutionary developmental biology of goldfish. Goldfish are one of the most popular ornamental animals. Their highly diverged shape and the colorations are quite popular. Interestingly, all of these diverged uh, strains belong to a crucian carp species, Calasius auratus. These various goldfish strains have been established from the Calasius auratus species by breeders and fanciers during the domestication process. But how did the Calasius species interact with humans just before the domestication began? We will first explore this point. A recent zooarchaeological study said the early Neolithic people cultured the fish species. They especially prefer the common carp, Cyprinus carupio. The common carp is known as one of the closely related fish to Calasius species that Neolithic people could easily access to the Calasius species, but they tend to consume common carp as a food. This means that the Neolithic people culturally really prefer the common carp and they finally established a functional aquaculture system for common carp. It is also known that an important script about the common carp aquaculture was also written in ancient China. This script was later cited in several books. This script describes a method that 20 mature females and 4 males are kept in the same pond. To me, personally, the strange thing is why there are no similar description of Calasius species. Simply my survey is insufficient or truly the ancient Chinese people really like the common cup, I don't know. But the important point is that these fish species were recognized as food, not ornamental fish. Perhaps agriculture and the associated irrigation system were compatible with the farming of these fish, just as the fish are kept for food in pond today, people in the past would have kept fish in the pond. However, the situation changed slightly in the Tang Dynasty. During the Tang Dynasty period, there was a growing cultural motivation to intensively maintain color mutant goldfish. This era was significant for goldfish domestication and was largely influenced by Buddhism. As a symbolic gesture, living creatures were released into ponds known as the Pond of Mashi. The Calasius species with color mutations may have also been recognized as special creatures with mysterious significance. And the situation is even more different in the Song Dynasty. The Song Dynasty marks a significant period in history of goldfish domestication. From this point on, people started building private ponds specifically for the purpose of keeping only goldfish for viewing. Private goldfish pond and the pond of mercy totally different in the community of kept organisms. In the pond of mercy, people released different types of animals including some other fish and the turtles. Goldfish have to compete with these animals. But in the private goldfish pond, goldfish do not have to compete with other animals. And in the Ming dynasty even more so, the situation changed. During the Ming Dynasty, particularly the late Ming Dynasty, there was significant development in goldfish breeding. Goldfish were kept in basins or aquariums. This caused significant differences in goldfish domestication compared to outdoor ponds. 
The smaller water volumes and the more controlled environment of aquarium cultures required more attention, which resulted in changes to the selective pressure on goldfish. Moreover, in the book Traces on Natural Beauties, there are detailed descriptions of sophisticated breeding methods for goldfish. According to the translation by Chen, 1954, this book said, after raining, put the breeding fish with the water grass into a new vessel of clear water. When you see the male fish chasing after and biting the female along the wall of the vessel, you know that it is time. When the biting is over, put the fish back into the old vessel. Examine the water grass in the light of sun. If you find little crystalline granules about the size of a millet, they are the eggs. Then put the water grass in the shallow earthen pot. From this text, we can infer that the goldfish breeders at the time were able to perform one to one genetic cross in their aquarium system. This method is a significant difference in the comparison with the random mating between multiple adult fish in the pond. This is an important point in the history of goldfish domestication as it allows breeders selectively control the genetic trait of the fish and establish new and unique varieties. So, based on my current knowledge, the Son to Min dynasties are recognized as important periods for the establishment of ornamental goldfish. New varieties have emerged over a very short period of time, just several hundred years. In other words, it is possible that these morphological changes occurred extremely fast compared to the time it takes for morphological evolution to occur in nature, and from the middle to modern ages, these ornamental strains of goldfish have been kept and spread worldwide. This video is based on my book, and my knowledge of goldfish domestication history depends on these early studies. I provide the detail of these studies. Please check the descriptions below. But history is a constantly updated field, and as research progresses, we may discover new information about the history of goldfish breeding. So, if you have any information, Please give me your comments. We have mainly focused on the history of goldfish breeding. From now on, I would like to talk about the early history of evolution and developmental biology of goldfish. From the Ming Dynasty onwards, people from the West began to actively come to China, and various goldfish strains were introduced to Western society. With the spread of these goldfish varieties, scientists at the beginning of the evolutionary studies observed the different types of goldfish. The unique morphologies of ornamental goldfish have fascinated two of the most influential early biologists. Charles Darwin and William Bateson. Darwin used ornamental goldfish variations to support his idea of gradual change in animal trait in his book. He described almost all of the mutated goldfish morphologies. Similarly, Bateson introduced twin tail goldfish in his monograph. He cited a goldfish study by a Japanese scientist. Watase Shouzaburo. Watase reported a detailed description of the morphology of the twin tail goldfish. Bateson used the twin tail goldfish as a representative example of discontinuous variations and protested against Darwin's gradual evolution. We have seen how past breeders, fanciers, and early scientists like Bateson and Darwin interact with goldfish. From here, I would like to focus specifically on twin tail goldfish among them. During the breeding process of goldfish, many varieties of twin tail goldfish were created. When we take a closer look at the caudal fins of these twin tail goldfish, we can see that the bifurcated caudal fin consists of left and right duplicated caudal skeletons. 
Considering that the skeletal structure of a caudal fin is part of the axial skeleton, this means that part of the axial skeleton has bifurcated in twin tail goldfish. It is quite difficult to find similar mutations in other vertebrates in the wild. So what's happened to the body of the goldfish? In order to clarify the cause of the bifurcation of the caudal fin of goldfish, we examine the genes of goldfish. As a result, we succeed in identifying the responsible gene for the twin tail morphology. We discovered that the twin tail goldfish had a mutation in a gene called codin. In the lineage of goldfish, the codin gene had been duplicated. And when one of the two coding genes acquired a stop codon mutation, the function of the coding gene is reduced. When a goldfish inherits this coding gene with a stop codon mutation from both parents, the caudal fin of the next generation of goldfish is duplicated. In other words, during the breeding process, individuals with this mutation in the coding gene were selected by humans. And as a result, twin tail goldfish strains were established in the goldfish population. However, this explanation alone might feel a bit insufficient for some of you. Think about it. The idea of a goldfish tail originally one suddenly splitting into two with a pop seems a bit unusual, doesn't it? I think using a human example can make this issue easier to understand. For instance, there is a story how over a long period, early hominins and modern human diverged. However, this explanation makes it sound like an adult hominin would gradually turn into a modern human adult with enough time. What's missing here is the process where a baby grows inside the mother's body and then matures into an adult. The same applies to goldfish evolution. To properly understand the process by which the caudal fin split into two, it's necessary to understand not only the history and the genes, but also the embryonic development process of goldfish. So let's first take a look at the embryonic development process of a single tail goldfish. After the egg is fertilized, it undergoes cell division over time, and the number of cells increases. And eventually, the egg hatches and the goldfish start to swim. Now let's focus again on the part of that becomes the caudal fin and look at it in more detail. You will see that the part of that will form the caudal fin is located on the ventral side on the embryo's body. If we go further back and observe the early stages of embryo, it's still in a round shape. At this stage, it may just appear like a simple sphere. However, it's already been determined which side will be the ventral side and which will be the dorsal side. Next, let's compare a single tail goldfish with a twin tail goldfish. The single tail goldfish, there is one membrane that will become a caudal fin, whereas in the twin tail goldfish, there are two membranes. Furthermore, when observed through a special method called institute hybridization, it becomes clear that in a single tail goldfish, the part that will form the caudal fin is one line. In contrast, in the twin tail goldfish, this part is split into two. When looking at the early stage embryos, we can see that the region where the caudal fin will form is larger in the twin tail goldfish. This difference is related to the role that the coding gene plays in the determining the balance of the size of the dorsal and ventral region in the fertilized egg. The coding gene is a gene that forms the dorsal side and plays a role in suppressing the function of the genes that form the ventral side. In the twin tail goldfish, the function of this gene is reduced, resulting in the expansion of the ventral region. Normally, in the twin tail goldfish and most of fish species, the embryo only had enough space to form just one caudal fin. In contrast, in the embryos of twin tail goldfish, the ventral region expands, creating enough space to form two caudal fins. 
However, a change in the function of the coding gene does not automatically lead to the development of two caudal fins in all animals. This is because if the balance between the dorsal and the ventral regions of embryo is completely disrupted, most vertebrates will not survive. This is likely because it becomes difficult for them to develop the tissues and organs necessary for survival. Therefore, such changes rarely occur. That's why animals like cats or dogs with two tails, as seen in folk tales, legend, fantasy stories, or manga, are almost non-existent in reality. Even if such creatures were born, they wouldn't live long or be able to live offspring. However, goldfish has two coding genes. In twin-tailed goldfish, even if one coding gene is damaged, the other gene can still form the tissues and organs necessary for survival. In other words, the embryos of twin-tailed goldfish maintain a delicate balance that allows them to develop duplicated caudal fins without severely disrupting the embryonic developmental process. Now think about how early people used to raise goldfish. This mechanism for embryonic development of twin-tailed goldfish is shaped by artificial selection. Of course, early people couldn't directly observe how genes functioned, so they probably didn't think, let's change the coding genes or let's alter the embryonic developmental process. Even so, by continuously selecting and breeding originally very rare twin-tailed goldfish that they liked, they unintentionally alter the embryonic developmental process and the molecular mechanism of goldfish. And this change occurred in a very short time from the Song Dynasty to the Min Dynasty. In general, such discontinuous morphological changes accompanied by modification in conserved developmental mechanisms are thought to take a long time to occur in the natural world. However, in the case of goldfish, multiple events come together, such as gene duplication mutations in the coding gene and the strong selection for unusual shapes. These evolutionary events led to changes in the usually hard-to-change developmental mechanisms resulting in the twin-tailed goldfish we see today. In other words, large-scale morphological evolution which usually takes hundreds of thousands of years or more occurred in goldfish over a few thousand or even a few hundred years. As Bateson's idea mentioned in the earlier part of this video suggests discontinuous change in animal morphology may seem mysterious at first. However, through the study of evolutionary developmental biology in goldfish, I hope you will gain some understanding of how these apparently discontinuous changes can occur. If you are interested in evolutionary developmental biology in goldfish, please take a look at our lab's YouTube channel. See you soon.